Good morning. Happy first Sunday of Advent. You are uh, here on a special Sunday, our hanging of the green service. So it's going to be a little different, um, a lot of reading to explain our decorations. But um, first, let me do a couple of announcements so you know what is coming up. Hopefully you looked in your bulletin. But tonight, make sure that you come back in here at 5 o'clock. Our choir will be performing their Christmas cantata. It's always a treat, 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Wednesday, we will have our usual supper at 5.30, but then at 6 o'clock is going to be a little different. We're going to go caroling, and it will be a few spots around um, the community. And don't skip out on this because you can't sing. I can't either, and I go every year, and they love it. All of the people we visit they just want you there in their presence with your smiles. They, they love it, so come and be a part of that special time. And that will be at 6 o'clock. Um, all right, next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we will have our church family Christmas time. So really, if you consider this person family, invite them. Come on, everyone's family at Williams. And we are going to go to the back 40, and that's over on Harold Boother Road, there's the number there at 525 Harold Booter Road. And we just ask that you bring your favorite finger foods um, to munch on. You know, we eat very well here. So let's gather, let's eat, and let's have a good time of fellowship, okay? All right, so my turn of yapping is over. Now it is your turn to yap. To at least five people say good morning, go. Y'all ready? You ready to start right? Okay, good. All right. Always love to hear y'all chit-chat. All right, so let's pray. Would you please pray with me? Gracious Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. We just can't stop saying it. You do so much for us. We are so grateful for all that you are. May you move in us this morning as we worship you. Move in us that... It just continues that spirit of yours is seen in us wherever we go and that everyone is touched by your love. In your name we pray, amen. As we begin the Christian year, we also celebrate the holy season known as Advent. It is a time when we prepare ourselves for the coming of our Messiah. Advent means arrival. We celebrate these days of Advent in expectation and preparation for Christ's arrival. Through the centuries, Christians have observed a time of waiting and expectation before celebrating the birth of the Savior at Christmas. The Advent season is a time for reflection and preparation, but its mood is joyful. Advent has been enriched by Christian tradition to reflect its distinctive Christian meaning. It proclaims the revelation of God's love as expressed in Christ's birth in a humble stable, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his victorious resurrection. It points to the hope of Christmas coming again as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Advent makes innkeepers out of all of us, asking each of us to make room for the arrival of Christ the King. Let us today prepare him room in our hearts, our lives, and our homes. Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. Let's stand as we sing, Come, thou long and expected Jesus. Sing it. Mike Duncan has always threatened to do something to ax me, and I think that he's finally figured out what it was. Uh, I know I'm getting a solo for that, Mike. We'll schedule it later. Okay. Uh, happy first Sunday in Advent, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Linkus. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, I'm the pastor here, and I'm just so overjoyed that you uh, are joining us here today. Um, the first Sunday of Advent, you know, it means that it's really only 20 more weeks until Easter. That's what you're all thinking about, right? Three more Sundays until it's Christmas. For retailers, Christmas really begins about October 20th. Um, and I know some of you exercise self-restraint in that you waited until November 9th to put up your Christmas decorations. Um, and maybe you think that Advent is really the first Sunday in the Christmas season for us. Jamie explained this just a minute ago, but Advent is really Advent. It's a celebration of anticipation. It's a season unto itself. Um, and my, my sister-in-law's Anglican church, uh, they don't even say Merry Christmas until December 24th. They don't, dec- they don't put up Christmas trees until Christmas Eve. Now, I know for some of you, what I just said in the last 15 seconds has sent you into a state of depression. <laughs> you're starting to, you know, the very ground of reality has, has shifted under your feet, and you may even be planning, like, charities for families, of, for, for children who, you know, their families don't decorate till Christmas Eve. Uh, but they're okay. Uh, my dad didn't decorate till December 24th growing up. He turned out all right, I think. Um, but let me focus on Advent for just a moment. Again, Advent's a word we don't use too often, but it just means a a coming or an an arrival, somebody showing up. Uh, And during Advent, we actually celebrate the Lord's coming in two ways. Um, It's almost like the beginning and end of a circle. So uh, I mentioned this last week, we are ending one Christian year. And as we, in the first Sunday of Advent, which is the week of hope, what we are anticipating 
is Christ's second coming. Jesus said that uh, he would return to us the same way in which he went. Uh, we expect him to come one day. And so part of, I feel like my role as your pastor during the season as we are, we are thinking about Christmas, and I don't want to, one of the great things about being a Baptist is that you can, you can, you're free to borrow and adapt anything you want to. You don't have to, there's no rule book other than the Bible that we follow. So, uh, but I want us to think about the second coming of Jesus, even as we remember his first. And we remember we put our places in the place of Israel, in the place of the world, waiting, pining after the, or, or pining for uh, the eventual coming of our Savior in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the dawn of salvation. So as we begin this Advent season, right, I want us to, especially today, uh, more than any of the other weeks in Advent, I want us to have this twofold perspective, right, looking backward, anticipating the birth of Jesus Christ, which has happened 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was born, but we also look forward. And uh, so with that in mind, I, I want our prayers to be infused uh, with uh, the coming of the second coming of Jesus in mind. So with that, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, we pray for the coming of Jesus Christ, your Son. Right, there are many with illness and death who long for your arrival to make all things new. Come, Lord Jesus. For all those who are beset with sin, both by their own sinning, but also in being sinned against. We look forward to the day whenever uh, you will make all things right. Come, Lord Jesus. For the rulers of the world, we ask for their wisdom, but at the same time, we long for your kingdom. Come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So would you come, Lord Jesus. And so, Almighty God, give us the grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Morning. 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 I'm waiting. I'm waiting. What are y'all waiting for? Are y'all waiting on anything? What? Oh, I just did. I, what are what are y'all waiting on? I'm waiting too. What what are y'all y'all waiting? Well, I'm waiting on Jesus to come. Y'all doing something? Well. Waiting is kind of boring. It's hard to do all this waiting. Twenty-four. Ooh, it's a lot of waiting. Well, I'll tell you this: I have this Advent calendar, and it's day one of December. So on this calendar, you get to count down to day twenty-four, right? And um. Each day you get a piece of candy, some chocolate. Well, I already ate my piece of chocolate for day one. I'm waiting on day two to get here because that chocolate was so good. Yeah, how out of waiting. Okay, how long, how many more hours do we have? Oh, at night? Well, I had to do it first thing. That chocolate was great. Well, anyways, we are in the time of Advent. We've had a lot of people talk this morning about that word, Advent. Oh, Santa Claus. 
But Advent is a time where we as Christians, we wait for Jesus to come. And while we wait oh so patiently, we have to prepare. We have to be ready. So the thing that we probably shouldn't be doing is just sitting around doing nothing and waiting. Probably not the best thing. (laughs) Jesus would rather us be doing something to prepare for him and his coming. So what are some good things that we could do for others and for ourselves while we wait on Jesus to come? Instead of doing nothing, what are some good things we could do? Tell people about Jesus. I read your mouth. Yep, that's right, Gabe. We can share all that we know about Jesus, share that good news. What else could we do? Neil, I know you have an answer. What's something good we could do while we wait? Do something good for other people. We feed those who are hungry here at the church. That's something good we could do. We could pray. That's a good way to prepare. Read our Bibles. There's a lot of things that we can do while we wait for Jesus to come. So don't forget to not just sit around and wait, but do something. Prepare while you wait for Jesus. And the cool thing is, Mike and Sharonda we to make sure that you enjoy this delicious chocolate with me for 24 days. So I have an Advent wreath for all of you. Are you going to share it? Okay, now, I know it's going to be tempting to go through all the pieces of chocolate, but we have to wait, Okay. Let's wait together. We'll eat day one in a minute, okay? All right, so let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you for this awesome time of waiting. Let us wait patiently for your coming. And while we wait, let us always be doing good for you. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so threes and fours are going to go up now. And the rest of us are going to stay put. We're going to help decorate in a minute, and then we'll go up to Children's Church. Deal? All right, let's go sit back down. Seen in the most universal feature of Christmas is the use of evergreens in churches and homes. Among ancient Romans, evergreens were an emblem of peace, joy, and victory. The early Christians placed them in their windows to indicate that Christ had entered the home. Holly and ivy, along with pine and fir, are called evergreens because they never change color. They are evergreen, ever alive, even in the midst of winter. They symbolize the unchanging nature of our God, and they remind us of the everlasting life that is ours through Christ Jesus. Under Christian thought and sentiment, Holly became widely used in church celebrations. Holly was considered as the burning bush or a symbol of Mary whose being glows with the Holy Spirit. The red berries represented the blood drops from the cruel thorns and the crown of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 60, verses 13, we find these words. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of your sanctuary. Let's stand once again as we sing this wonderful Christmas hymn. Go and tell it on the mountain. Let's sing it together. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go.
Amen. You may be seated. Today, the Christmas tree is the center of our festivities, glittering with lights and ornaments. It is a part of the beauty and meaning of Christmas. There are several legends and stories about the Christmas tree. The first use of the Christmas tree was a medieval German paradise place held outdoors and portraying the creation of humankind. The tree of life was a fir tree decorated with apples. Later, other ornaments were hung upon them, such as paper flowers and gilded nuts. In England, branches or whole trees were forced into bloom indoors for Christmas. From these beginnings, the use of a tree at Christmas was established. The Christmas poinsettia. Most Christmases, greenery reflects European tradition, but one colorful plant which looks like a flaming star, the poinsettia. It is native to American continent. It was named after Dr. Joel Poinsett, an ambassador to Mexico who first introduced it to the United States in 1828. The people of Mexico and Central America call this brilliant tropical plant the flower of the holy night. The poinsettia is a many pointed star that has become a symbol of the star of Bethlehem. Amen. Let's stand. Before we sing this final hymn, I want you to reflect on this wonderful verse. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Sing it. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and trust. Father, thank you for these opportunities that you provide us with. Thank you for the direction in which you guide us with, Lord. Help us to always never be too caught up in our own little world that we do not grasp these opportunities. And help us to never, never not follow your direction. Because we know these things reside in our heart. And that is where you reside, Lord. And we thank you for that. It's your son, I, Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Advent is a time of expectation. And this is symbolized not only by the four-week period of preparation, but also by the lighting of an Advent candle and an Advent wreath on each Sunday of the season. The flame of each new candle reminds us, the worshipers, that something is happening and something more is still to come. The candles are arranged in a circle to remind us of the continuous power of God, which knows neither beginning nor ending. There's also symbolism in the colors of the candles. The four purple candles symbolize the coming of Christ from the royal line of David. He is coming as the king of kings, as well as the prince of peace. The large white candle in the center is known as the Christ candle and points to Jesus as the Christ, the light of the world. A progression is noted in the lighting of the candles of the Advent wreath each Sunday. Each candle symbolizes various aspects of our waiting experience. The culmination of the season comes as we light the Christ candle on the evening of Christmas Eve. We join in rejoicing that the promise of long ago has been fulfilled. Today we light the Messiah of Prophecy candle. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. 750 years before Jesus' birth, the prophet Isaiah predicted that a descendant of King David, Israel's greatest king, would come and reign over the kingdom of God. Many other prophets saw the coming of the Messiah who would deliver his people, but Isaiah spoke of his nature, his character. He calls him Wonderful Counselor, the ultimate source of wise counsel. He is said to be the mighty God, coming with God's presence and mighty power to the earth. He is the Prince of Peace. There will be no more wars or conflicts, no more arrangements, estrangements from God. As Messiah's reign covers the earth, he will sweep in a wave of peace throughout the empire. He is, the, he is called Everlasting Father. He comes in time and space. He's eternal. He never has a beginning, nor will he have an end. He is forever. His kingdom, too, will never fail. There is much we would like to know about him, but we do not know, but what we do know is he is wonderful. His kingdom will be just towards ever the weakest, the poorest, the most marginalized. But the king is a good king, a righteous Lord. King Jesus is good himself. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the child who is born to us, who we celebrate this time of year. For we long the time of his kingdom will come fully on earth as it is in heaven now. We open our hearts, O King. We desire to live under you, under your rule now in his life, and serve you forever and ever. Amen. One of the most heartwarming expressions of Christmas is the nativity. The nativity speaks of the mystery of God's wisdom. Why God chose to send his son into our world as a baby of humble birth or in common surroundings, we do not know. What we do know is that God reached out to all people, including the poor and wealthy, the simple and the wise, the powerless and the powerful. All who found him knelt in humility before him. Whenever we see a nativity, we find ourselves with Mary and Joseph, with the shepherds, and with the wise men bowing before the manger, overwhelmed by God's expression of love and coming to us. Today, we display a nativity in our sanctuary 
on your communion table in the center of our worship space to remind us of who we should always worship when we gather in this space and to focus our attention on this season and his birth. Our last reading this morning will be the, the Christ of Christmas. The greatest gift of Christmas is the gift of God in Christ Jesus. All that we do during this holy season points to that expression of holy love. Christ came as a babe in Bethlehem, God's gift at Christmas. At Christmas. As Christians, we seek to pass on our heritage to our children and to those who, by faith in Christ, become part of the family of God. It is through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine that the gift goes on. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping this this is Christ whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him love, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come, peasant. King to own him, the King of kings, salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ, the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Taste, taste to bring him love, the babe, the son of Mary. This, this is Christ, the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring. In love, the babe, the son of Mary. Thank you, Pat and Linnell, the choir, and Sean and Haley, and everyone who's helped us so far to participate in this joyful celebration. If you have your Bibles with you today, I want to invite you to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, it's near the end. Why 
while you're finding your place there, I wanted to uh, let you know about something. You may have seen some of these in the lobby in the back. Some of them there might may have been in your Sunday school rooms. We have some Advent devotionals this year that we've been given, and I just want, if you are interested in having one, we have enough. I don't know how many you have enough for, but let's just say we'll keep it to one per family at maximum, um, just if you're looking for something extra to do devotionally during the Advent season. So uh, we've got some in the, in the back on a little table. You can see those on the way out. All right, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. If you found your place in God's holy and perfect word, I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we, all, as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And let's pray. God, would you speak to us now? Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that would understand what your Holy Spirit has revealed in your word. For we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, very often, our lives are shaped by deadlines. Deadlines. You, many of you know this, and you're experiencing it right now at work. Uh, you've got a project that is due before the end of the year, and you're working frantically to get that done so that you can finally re relax when the holidays come at the end of the month. Maybe you're a student or a teacher, and you are counting down the days. You know exactly how many school days you have between now and Christmas break. If you're a college student, you know you've got this week to turn in your final papers and to study because exams start in just a few days. I've got a, a, a countdown app on my computer right now that I've used to remind me of two things that I have coming up. One of them is a big paper I have due in 10 days, and I think you all know what the other one is. <laughs> all right, the past several months, I have lived my life in anticipation of a significant arrival due January 5th. This anticipation, it creates a sense of excitement, but also a little bit of fear, uh, and if I'm honest, a, a slight sense of foreboding. Uh, because I know that I'll receive another three-year sentence of what the writer might cost for calls baby jail, <laughs> okay? The anticipation of our son's arrival, it changes my thoughts uh, and my actions. It changes how I respond to invitations, right? If someone asks me to do something or if they invite me to go to, to you know, come to this party, come to this thing, I kind of think twice about, like, the limited amount of time I have left and what I might need to be doing uh, before the baby comes. And here's the case in point, Okay. Uh, many of you know I went back to Michigan in May, and the last day I was in Michigan, they said, okay, the next time you need to be here is January 6th for our next seminar. And so I put on my calendar, I'm going to be flying out January the 5th. Three weeks later, I learned that uh, January the 5th needed to be held for something different, okay? And it took precedence. I canceled the trip to Michigan. Uh, and so uh, anyway, here, here, here's what it reminds me of. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways higher than our ways, his plans better than our plans. His timing, whether we realize it or not, especially in the moment, is always better than our timing. At the season of Advent, we look forward to the birth of a baby. Like we, we look back to look forward to the birth of Jesus Christ. All right, the, the baby's birth, his advent, was the arrival of the Son of God. And again, it's just we want to put ourselves in the position of Israel. Right, you're under foreign occupation. You don't have your own independence, and things are really not as God desired. So, when is God going to send this Messiah? But we look forward to the future coming of Jesus. And after that first coming, Jesus lived. He he died. He rose again. But then he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and we believe that one day he will come to judge the quick and the dead. We look forward to the coming of the once present, and future King, Jesus Christ. And I think that whenever we live our life, just like me preparing my life in anticipation for the birth of this baby coming soon, 
we must live our lives, this future reality that is coming, we must change our lives for that deadline, right? That we uh, live, that's what it means to live in hope. We live as if that thing really is true, we're going to live into that. Well, as we contemplate the future return, the future advent of Jesus Christ, I think that we are helped greatly by the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, it's not as glamorous or as well-known as the books to the letters to the Romans or the Ephesians that Paul wrote, but it is a very important letter. Many think that it's probably the first letter that Paul wrote that we have uh, in our New Testament. It gives many instructions concerning practical matters of life and faith. And particularly, it refers many times to the coming of Jesus Christ in the future. There are five chapters in 1 Thessalonians. Every single chapter, you can check this out, every single chapter ends with a reference to Christ's coming in the future including our chapter today. So as we consider these three verses at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, here's what I hope that you'll see. As we hope between the already and the not yet of Christ's victory over sin and death, God is sanctifying us in love for love in order that we might join the host of saints at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians, one of the reasons I love reading it is its tone. Paul is writing to this church with great affection. If you've read some of the other letters, Galatians, uh, or or, or maybe, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones now, but but like, uh, if you read the letters, there's normally an issue, right? Galatians, he starts off in in a panic, like, I can't believe you've sold out the gospel for this other false teaching. First Thessalonians doesn't doesn't start with that type of panic. It's actually a letter infused with love. Like, Paul just has such fond affection for this congregation. If you read in the book of Acts chapter 17, Whenever he arrives in the city of Thessalonica, which is in the mainland of Greece, kind of northern Greece, uh, he leads them to faith. He starts the first church there. And so he writes in in chapter 2, verse 7, he says, you know, I have this affection for you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. There's maternal imagery there, but then just a few verses later in chapter chapter 2, verse 11, he says, I loved you like a father for his children and how we exhorted you. And encouraged you, charging you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own glory and kingdom. All right, so as our passage opens, we still get a sense of that love because he says, I really am earnestly praying that our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ will send me to you, that he'll make a way for me to get in your presence. So as these Christians live together in anticipation of Christ's return, how does that hope shape their life together as a church? Right? Because Christ is victorious, but as we all know, sin and death, they still poke and prod, don't they? Right? Temptation has power over our lives. It affects our community. And so Paul has two prayers that he prays in, this, uh, in these few verses, and I want us to just note them, okay? So as Paul's praying for this church, he prays two things for them. Number one, he prays that they have a holistic love, and two, that they live holy lives. Did you catch that? They, number one, that they have a holistic love, and two, that they live holy lives. First, he prays that they have a holistic love. Look at verse 12. Now may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Right, The most important type of church growth that any church can experience is that we grow in love. Right, There are churches of 2,000 who are doing many wonderful and great things for the kingdom. There are six flags over Jesus, but they are lacking in love, the very thing that God has called us to. And there are churches of 40 that are short on people and money, and they're sometimes wondering if they'll be able to pay the bills for the next few months. And you know what they're full of? They're full of love and of hope. They're bearing the fruit that God has instilled in them in Christ Jesus. Right, here's the thing, having experienced the love of God in Christ Jesus, even while we were yet dead in our trespasses and sin, the Bible says that in the fullness of time, God sent his son Jesus to be born of the virgin, right, to redeem us, to die on the cross for our sins. Again, while we were sinners, right, not after we fixed everything and then he said, okay, I guess y'all have earned it. No, in grace, he sends his son Jesus Christ to us. He's He saves us in love. So having been loved by God, he then commands us to love others. 
Uh, Paul prays another in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Again, another letter that is overwhelmingly positive in its content. And he says, my prayer is that your love would abound, that it would increase, that it would grow more and more with knowledge and all discernment. I want your love to be even better than it already is. And that's got a lot of love already. Right? It's a love that is holistic. It's not just for, it is for one another, right? The, the, the New Testament is replete with these commands to love one another, but also we're told that we are to love our enemies, that we are to love the world. So the first thing that Paul prays is they live in hope in anticipation of Christ's coming, that they live with a holistic love. Here's the second thing that he prays, number two, that they live holy lives. Look at verse 13. Paul prays that God might establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. May he establish your hearts blameless and in holiness. So as they love, notice that the first fruit of their love is holiness, to be set apart for God and his purposes. And and notice, this is important for us to realize as Christians, that love is a prerequisite to holiness. Often when we think of holy rollers or people who are holier than thou, we think of people who are devoid of love. All they can do is live and exist in judgmentalism. But there is no love, there's no holiness where love is absent. And we can also say that without holiness, love is also empty. But he's more descriptive of the type of holiness he wants to see in the very next few verses. If we roll forward just a little bit into chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his or her own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother and sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness." Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Right? Paul is not calling for holiness in the abstract. and In particular, he's calling them to resist the sexually licentious spirit of the age. Right? The first century Thessalonica was not altogether dissimilar from 21st century America. We're not alone. But God has called us in holiness. The, the language that is used here is that we were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's not work we do by ourselves, but God actually has given himself to us that we might do this, that we might be holy and blameless. Right? Blameless doesn't mean that you're perfect and that you've never made a mistake, but it means that you can live with no regrets, right? And living with no regrets doesn't mean that you have a YOLO type of lifestyle, that you never, uh, you, you took every opportunity you had and you know, you went skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing. You went 4.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, okay? That's what we think about with living with no regrets. But here's what living with no regrets means in God's eyes. It means that you can go forward living not having regretted any of the actions that you did. Not what you didn't do, but what you did, okay? Because you've committed to live your life before God. Right? Holistic love and a holy life. These can only be experienced with God's power. And in fact, God uses these to sanctify us, to to make us holy, namely to make us saints. Whenever we talk about someone who's a saint, we typically think of the people who are in the hall of fame of the Christian life. You can look at them. And and you know what? We ought to be thankful that we have those people in our life that we can look to and say, these are model Christians that we can live for. But according to the Bible's usage, saints are not just the holiest of holies, but rather they are every single person who has been called for salvation in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, right? Because if if you believe in Jesus Christ, he has made you holy. He has imparted his Holy Spirit to you, and so now he has set you apart. He has consecrated you for his service in the world today. You are a saint. And so while it is is good and right to aspire toward saintliness, to hope towards that, not so that we can earn our salvation not so that we can have pride over any other Christian or so that we can show up to God in heaven one day and say, see what I did for you, but rather that we might one day join the host of saints that will come at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? To be established blameless at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus means that we can join that heavenly assembly, right? meaning that God can have his way and his will with us. 
Right? Whenever we pray that line in the Lord's Prayer, your, will be, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that has to begin in our lives. If not, then we're just taking God's name in vain. But it begins with us. None of our sanctifications look the same, but the Lord who calls us is the same Lord. Right? The word that we live by is unchanged. Again, God has given himself to us by his Holy Spirit. And so we're not alone in this life. So here's my charge to you as we begin this first Sunday of Advent, as we look forward, preparing to look backward, to live in hope. Hold on to Jesus Christ. Hold on to the hope that he has given us. Look forward to his second coming with joy, not fear, with love, not anxiety, with anticipation and not dread. As I come to a close today, would you hear these parting words from Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who has called you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, we look forward to the coming of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. And would you help us to help us to have our clocks right? Help us to be able to realize where we live, when we live. Right? That this this little blip of time here in the present is is not all that there is, but rather you have been at work for millennia in eternity past, and that you are doing a work that is even greater than we can realize and grasp within our own lifetimes. And so, Father, given what we know is true about you and about what your son Jesus Christ has purposed for us and for our salvation. I just pray that you would help us to calibrate our lives according to that. God, may our timekeeper not be Silicon Valley. May it not be just the patterns and rhythms of our nation or the school system or our jobs, whatever it is, but that we would have our lives attuned to you. As we wait, would you give us patience? Help us to see, to taste, to smell, to yearn toward that hope, which is the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. seated. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today to celebrate the first Sunday of Advent, to participate in our hanging of the green. Uh, But please do not forget that tonight at 5 p.m., the choir will be presenting our Christmas cantata. They've been working on this for months, and I know it's going to be excellent. So we invite you to come, invite your friends and your family to join you. Uh, And this will be just a, again, This is a great kickoff today, but really the kickoff doesn't end until tonight. So please come and join us. Take a look at the rest of our Christmas activities as we go caroling this coming Wednesday. We'll have our Christmas party next week as well. Uh, And take note of when our Christmas Eve services are too. Uh, But this is just such a joyful time. We're excited to to, uh, join you and your families as we celebrate Christ's coming. So would you please back ahead of me and let's, let's pray. God, I thank you for everyone that is here today as we go forward from this place. I pray that you would... Bless us and keep us and make your face to shine upon us and give us peace. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.